this uh, piece of chicken, which I think has been uh, grown in the lab and battered here or crumbed and then fried. Journalist said he was a bit more gassy for the rest of the day. Okay, I didn't need, didn't need to know that. If it looks like chicken and smells like chicken, well, it'll take off. Hello, welcome to the Cross of the Connections with Jack Wayne podcast. I'm a scientist and a college professor at an Australian university. The USDA allows lab-grown meat to be sold to US consumers. After Singapore, US becomes the second country in the world to allow sale of meat grown from animal cells. And this has been driven in the US by two companies, Upside Foods and Good Meat, and they were given uh, permission. So USDA is US Department of Agriculture, and specifically they're going to make chicken grown from animal cells in large metal vats. I've got a lot of thoughts on this, but first let's see what the article says about the viability of this technology and what's going to happen. The nascent lab-grown meat sector. I like that phrasing, the nascent lab-grown meat sector. It's gathered pace over the last few years. Lots of startups trying to jostle for a piece of this market. If you can be the first to market with a meat product that is quote-unquote more sustainable, that's a huge claim to have. And you could be very smug about maybe all the environmentally friendly claims. They're not vegetarian. They're meat grown in a setting more familiar to the pharmaceutical industry rather than the food industry. They take some cells from an animal without harming the animal, and then they grow those cells to a point where it resembles meat. The fact that you can buy these products in a restaurant means it's more likely to impact your everyday life straight away. So this is a more realistic example of scientists' ability to grow cells. That claim of it being more ethical or more sustainable meat that's grown in a lab rather than meat that is taken from animal is quite questionable because to grow cells in a flask or in a metal vat like these startups are claiming to do both labor intensive resource intensive in terms of the energy required to run those metal vats those incubators the chemicals needed to keep those cells alive all of that takes so much energy and planning and troubleshooting and experimenting these are startups after all so many of them will fail especially when the reagents are so expensive, I don't think you can make the claim that it's actually better or more sustainable. It is similar to the argument we're making about AI currently, about artificial intelligence being so efficient and so productive and it's transforming how the whole world works. The secret about AI is that for it to work well and give you good human-like responses, a lot of humans have to vet and train those data sets in the beginning, coupled with the enormous processing power that needs to be done by machines to calculate words that are coming out of something like chat GPT. And that is burning up a whole lot of environmental resources as well. There's a lot of indirect consequences or unintended consequences of any kind of big breakthrough. Whether or not these kinds of lab-grown meats will actually be more efficient is a big question mark. Another interesting perspective to look at is if it looks like chicken and smells like chicken, will it take off? Because you can invest all this money and make oodles of this meat, but if consumers don't view it as the same, they won't be willing to partake. And that industry, that sector will never have the enough capital to be able to take it to the next level. Which brings me to this article from Inverse. A person, a writer here, they looked at chicken, which I think has been uh, grown in the lab and battered here or crumbed and then fried. They've had it on some kind of bun and it tastes like chicken, doesn't necessarily feel like chicken. The meat has a texture that's somewhere between fish and dark meat poultry and it's grown in a vat that resembles the machine at a dairy factory. Chicken meat that actually never clucked as a fully grown chicken is grown in a vat. How does it actually work? The company extracts cells from chickens that we already eat, parts of chickens that includes muscles and skin tissue. Then they breed these cells, grow them in these giant metal vats or these flasks and then they analyze them and then allow them to produce over and over again quality tissue. Sounds really appetizing so far, right? Quality tissue. And they engineer them to make them en masse. On top of that, they have to give these cells food. Cells don't grow without food. So they need to give them amino acids, fatty acids, sugars, trace elements, salts, and vitamins. And all of these are a proprietary mix. The companies can't tell you exactly what they give these cells because that's their secret source. That's how they're going to make the money. And once they grow them into this enormous, Enormous vessel, take it out, dehydrate it, flatten it, and sell it like you would sell chicken at a supermarket, except the production of that is a completely different process. It doesn't actually involve animal beyond initially scraping the cells from those animals at the beginning. What did this person say about how it tasted? The person in question eating this chicken, and the texture was close to, to real chicken, slightly uncanny. He also gives out too much information. Journalist said he was a bit more gassy for the rest of the day. Okay, I didn't need, didn't need to know that, but I guess the digestion of that chicken would be a little different than how we would digest other chicken. So the technology looks like it has promise from a consumer level. It looks like chicken, it tastes like chicken. I guess the question will be, 
scalability. How will this be able to be mass produced? Because I'm going to come back to that point I made earlier. Science is not exciting for the reason you think it is. It is simultaneously much more interesting than you realize and also really, really way more boring than you care to want to know. Because to get to this point where you've got a neat little piece of engineered chicken growing in a test tube, there is so much routine, boring, step-by-step -step protocol optimization that has to go in for this to even become an economic reality. And I'm going to show you two bits of reagents that we very routinely use in a lab to culture a tiny little bit of animal cells. So these are cells you can buy from large tissue banks. They are not collected from live animals. They were what we call immortalized. These are cells that are designed to grow and keep growing. Often they're isolated from patient tumor samples, patients who have cancer, those tumors are donated to science. And the good thing about tumor cells in this context is that tumor cells, they are engineered to grow and grow. That's their programming. They want to overgrow and double because we need a lot of cells to work with to be able to study these processes again and again and again. But they need a lot of food and that food is very expensive. Two reagents I'll show you. The first one is DMEM, D-M-E-M, and this is sold from a number of companies, but this is from Thermo Fisher Scientific. This red nutrient media has a lot of different things in it, including glucose, including sugars, which allows these cells to be living, A, in a kind of semi-hydrated environment, so it's not completely dehydrated throughout its lifespan and also gives it some sugar and other nutrients. You can see that one liter of it costs about a hundred Australian dollars. But really, if you're making giant vats of meat that are to be sold across the country of the United States, you will need way more than a liter of this liquid right? You will need thousands and thousands of liters. So this cost starts going up. This price is not for the cells. This is just for the food to give the cells. It's not a farmer, so I don't know how much chicken feed costs, but this is pretty expensive chicken feed. Right? This is $100 for one liter, and you can scale it up exponentially depending on how much chicken you want to engineer. This is just the tip of the iceberg because this is actually not enough nutrients for most of the cells to live in. The cells need another layer on top of that most of the time. They, they need something that's called serum. And the most common serum that we we use in a tissue culture lab is uh, something called fetal bovine serum. And it is essentially serum that has a lot of factors that promote growth in it. Growth factors, hormones, lipids, sugars, vitamins, proteins that help those cells attach to surfaces and keep growing very comfortably. And this is the most common one. And it's very expensive as well. It's usually isolated from cows of bovine. You can see that there is a long drawn out process of collecting this serum. You've got to then screen it because you do not want toxins. You do not want bacteria to be within this serum. You're giving it to cells that are living in a flask, so they're pretty fragile anyway. This is a very expensive process for both collecting it and packaging it and assuring that it has a certain amount of quality assurance. If we look at the cost of this for half a liter, we're talking eight to 900 Australian dollars. That price has gone up, it used to be $500. So we're talking for a liter of this serum, about $1,000, in excess of $1,000 for this serum. So the combination of the nutrient media and the serum, when you add those two things together, we're talking thousands of dollars just for a tiny little flask of cells that we work with in a tissue culture lab. If you're talking giant metal vats, man, that cost starts escalating. And again, I'm not a farmer, but that is some pretty expensive chicken feed. The cost of it will be very, very interesting to watch out for going forward because we know as scientists doing these experiments that culturing cells is not cheap and we're working with much smaller volume of cells than people trying to make it into this chicken meat that you can sell all over the world. You can find our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, as well as Google Podcasts, as well as the full episodes are on the YouTube channel, Biolab Collective with Jack Wang. I'm Jack and hope to connect with you again next time around.